All right, guys, you have uh, 13 minutes to fix the state of the world. What do we do? Often wrong, but seldom in doubt. <laughs> uh, so let, let me give you five to, to start off with. We're, we're going to talk about, we're each going to give you uh, 10 concrete ideas for uh, fostering innovation in the United States. The entrepreneurs out there in the, in the uh, audience might take some of these and run yeah. with them? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start off with one that President Obama talked about today, which is a no-brainer, uh, which is making the research and ex experimentation tax credit permanent. He proposed uh, making it permanent, expanding it, and uh, also making it e easier for firms to figure out whether they're eligible for the credits. That's number one. Second is to, in the same way that the government invested in the ARPANET and the NSFNET, which led to today's internet, is to invest in those areas of research and development uh, which have a chance of creating the technologies and industries of the future. So let me give you some examples of areas where there's a lot of interest from the, from the research community. Uh, robotics, uh, nanoelectronics, in the same way that Bell Labs allowed us to make the transition from the vacuum tube to the transistor, what do we do after we reach the fundamental physical limits of today's silicon technology? What are the ideas like graphene and spintronics that will allow us to continue to stay on the Moore's Law curve for, for decades to come. Data intensive science and engineering. Many uh, disciplines are now generating uh, data at a much more rapid uh, rate, petabytes and even exabytes of data um, that is outstripping our ability to derive scientific inferences to create economic and societal value from that data. So what are the investments that we need to, to make in that area in areas like scalable algorithms for machine learning? Uh, an idea which came in response to one of our requests for information, uh, an a idea for a materials genome project that would allow us to dramatically reduce the time needed to design and optimize uh, new materials for applications in, in, uh, in energy and other areas. By the way, I think material science is one of those areas that that we completely have lost track of, yeah. and it's due for an immense explosion. Yeah, yeah. So that's the second one, is, is investing in R&D in areas that is likely to, to create the foundations for the industries and, and technologies of the future. Third one is uh, to establish some grand challenges. Uh, if you go to the president's innovation strategy, he identifies a series of goals which are ambitious but not wildly unrealistic. So making solar cells as cheap as paint, developing smart anti-cancer therapeutics that deliver drugs only to tumor cells, um, developing educational software that is as effective as a personal tutor and compelling as the best video game and improves the more students use it. So what, one question is innovation for what? Uh, so innovation is not always an end in itself. It's the relationship between innovation on the one hand and national priorities. And I don't think the government should be doing this uh, solely. I, I'd love to see uh, companies embrace a grand challenge that they're prepared to support uh, with their intellectual capital, with their research, with the skills of their employees. A fourth is something uh, our DARPA director, uh, Regina Dugan, talks about, and that is the renaissance of wonder. Uh, what is it that would be like the Apollo project and the impact that that had uh, on people in the 1960s? Or the chemistry set? How many uh, you know, scientists and engineers have you talked to recently who are in their you know, nearing retirement and they'll say, you know, I first got interested in this when I had an opportunity to blow something up. So what, what's the equivalent of that uh, today? Is it um, you know, the this maker movement uh, that you and your uh, Dale Doherty and uh, have been involved in of being able to put the tools to uh, conceive, design, fabricate, and test uh, with things like the 3D printers and and uh, and, fa and fab labs. Uh, and the fifth one I'm going to talk about is student-led innovation. So uh, when I was at uh, uh, UC Berkeley, I wound up getting a grant. Uh, via uh, uh, Stu Stuart Brand and the Ominiar Network, and I decided to use it to fund uh, students directly. And I, I just found that there was incredible power in giving students much more uh, autonomy earlier in their career as opposed to solely working on the projects that had been identified by their 
advisor, as smart as they are. Right? So those are my first five. Okay, Lisa, how about you? Those were way more than five. <laughs> yeah, um. he, kind of, he, had sub, <laughs> I had, he had sub bullets. I had little A's. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll agree with almost all of them. So, um, and I would absolutely, as a first one, say we need to renew, especially for our children, um, whether it be through um, FIRST, Dean Kamen's program, FIRST Robotics. Um, I, I think there are so many not-for-profit organizations out there and uh, unfortunately philanthropies like ourselves and others struggle through which ones to fund, but there are some that have actual and genuine results that are clear to see. And FIRST Robotics is a number one in my case in terms of creating a, a new generation of engineers uh, and computer scientists, many of whom we've heard from today. Um, other organizations like that that could help create this ecosystem, Maker Fair, completely agree. Um, and Tim, I'm not giving you both of these because they're both your spin outs, but um, obviously Code for America is the other one. We've heard multiple oh. times today. Uh, sorry, I, I have to correct you on that. Maker Fair uh, I, I, I definitely came from O'Reilly. Code for America, I am on the board, but I'm an enthusiastic supporter. But enthusiastic supporter, like, yeah. okay, well, yeah. good. <laughs> I came in after the fact on that one. But I think in, in all three of these cases, these are ecosystem builders. Yeah. In every single case, um, in Maker Faire, we just saw in Detroit, 25,000 people come together in a city where engineers don't even know each other because they all work in big companies and, and aren't um, literate in language of entrepreneurship. Um, I would say on the same side of ecosystem building, we're funding thousands of university scientists in our country who know nothing about entrepreneurship. Um, so our inability to get their technology out of their lab and have it simply be awesome innovation um, that is sitting within the lab, we're not doing anything about it. Um, there are very few um, entrepreneurship programs aimed at university scientists and faculty of the ones there are we fund, but we can't fund them all. So I would ask for lots of entrepreneurs in this country to come forward and come together to support, like adopt a scientist program mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that would help support commercialization of, of university technology. Um, and I would say, and I'll, I'll give this three, um, whether it be Code for America or other mechanisms, um, I've heard over and over today, um, whether it be Steve from VMware or others, we have plenty of technology in this country. What we have are significant policy barriers. And I'm not gonna put the sole onus on poor Tom who has <laughs> the second hardest job or third, third hardest job in Washington, but we don't have enough people focusing on how do we reduce these policy barriers. And, and whether it's in the space of energy, whether it's in the space of life science or others. So I, I'll even give that one three chits. Yeah, I'll add one to that. I, I'd love to see more scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs in Congress. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a, a really great point, and, and Tom's aware of this. I. Um, provided testimony before the House Science and Technology Committee in, in um, June of this year on this topic of university commercialization. And the two congressmen that showed up were both um, former faculty at universities who had awesome and informative questions, both of whom are leaving Congress. Yeah. Um, so that, that scares me. Yeah. So Tom, you have more. Yes. Uh, so number six uh, was in line with Lisa's, that is, uh, create a movement to increase the number of innovation hotspots. So this should not be limited to Research Triangle Park and Silicon Valley and San Diego. Uh, so I think we're beginning to see some models like the Y Combinator model and Techstars and uh, Launchpad at, in uh, mm -hmm. a, a university in Florida that are, are really helping to improve the ecosystem and seeing those scale up in a larger number of communities. Number seven would be uh, to uh, you know, recruit more Todd Parks to the government. People like that are really having an enormous uh, impact, uh, the work that he's been doing with the Web 2.0 community around the Community Health Data Initiative. People like that that have the ability to convene and pre uh, present a really compelling vision and, uh, and, and get a lot of people interested in working on that. Um, there are policies that impact particular sectors. So the impact that the government has on 
uh, spectrum policy obviously has a big impact on wireless. So I think there are a whole set of industry and sector specific uh, policies where there's room for improvement. Uh, number nine is taking advantage of the government as user. So think about the impact that the government had by creating GPS. It wasn't uh, thinking about how can I enable where to o and location-based services, but that was a great example of the government serving as an, as an early adopter of a technology that went, wound up having a big impact. Um, institutional innovation, so thinking about not just technological innovation, but um, as we think about how does the government get the capacity uh, to use information technology more aggressively? What if there was something between a nonprofit on the one hand uh, and a profit maximizing firm on the other that would be interested in working with the government? So people are talking about social enterprises and impact investing and B Corps to explore this yep. intermediate space between the you know, traditional firm and, and, and the nonprofit that is reliant totally on, on soft dollars. Well, and I think it's something that, uh, uh, Lisa, you and I talked about Jim Sporer's work at IBM Research, uh, you know, where we said, look, you know, IBM's business is now 70% services, yet all we're doing is still doing you know, hard you know, science research. Yeah. Uh, we need to start understanding how we build better institutions, how we do build better services, and I think you know, that shows all through healthcare. You look at something like the you know, Atul Gawande book, The Checklist Manifesto, that's really all about uh, you know, how do we actually understand the science uh, of, of healthcare? How do we turn the practice itself into science as opposed to just we use the products of science? So, Lisa, more, more from Well, I mean, and, and on that topic, I mean, what I would love to see, and you and I were part of this discussion up in Detroit, while there are a lot of people like Paul Romer and others who want to adopt charter cities in other countries, um, I'm worried, and, and Claire and I are, are good friends on this topic um, relative to what we call expeditionary economics, that we are highly focused on how to recover other cities in other countries. And, um, I, you know, we need to adopt Detroit. Um, and we need more people to adopt Detroit that are real entrepreneurs, not just philanthropists. And all of us are up there are philanthropists, um, but frankly, we need um, Jen and a number of other people who could adopt Detroit as a city where Jim can try out some of his proof of concept work. We could focus the universities up there with new policies, et cetera. So I'm up for adopting a city and let's find out what's gonna happen. That's right. Create, yeah, we'll make the first energy independent city in America, for example. We'll right. Great challenge. Yeah, why do we just have yeah, to why do this do in the UAE? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's figure out, can we totally rebuild, uh, you know, yes, I think that's a great one. Anything yeah. else before we wrap up? Uh, well, I'd like to see a pattern language for getting big, important stuff done. Yeah. I love that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times what you need is to blend uh, the skill sets of people from different sectors. And as Beth was saying, a lot of times, one of the reasons it's difficult for people to collaborate with the government is they have no idea what goes inside the black box that we yeah. call government. And if you were able to, to combine the tools and techniques yeah. of government, civil society, the private sector, the philanthropic community, um, there are a lot of problems that need that sort of all hands on deck approach. You know, as I know we're out of time, but I want to bring up something that Peter Ho said at dinner last night. He was describing a situation in Singapore, uh, and he said that we had a problem with a contract, and I had to say to the contractor, "I don't care what's in the in the contract. We are working together to solve this problem." Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that one of the things that we need to do is to adopt that attitude. And he, he described a kind of process of spiral experimentation to kind of work out a problem until it's solved. And all the stakeholders uh, getting together, understanding that they have the same goal rather than, well, this is what we agreed to um, you know, three years ago, and let's go back and, and have the lawyers fight over the document. You know, how do we build that spirit mm -hmm. of cooperation in solving our great problems? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. One, one more that I want. I have one more chit left. Um, and I want education entrepreneurs. Um, I think if there's one thing that we can do to completely change, and we are a huge supporter of KIPP, Teach for America, and others, but I think if there's one thing that we can do in this new world of technology advocacy that we can use is literally create for-profit companies 
that can enable our kids to not necessarily have dependency on teachers and learn at a much faster rate than they are today. That's right, I'm with you. Let's build Dale Doherty's smart grid for informal education. Yes. All right, thank you very, very much. I love the list of ideas and I hope they inspire some uh, 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 policy changes as well as some entrepreneurs to go out and tackle some of these things. Great, All right. thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.